because this is a couple hundred years old. You know, we've got orchids on the ground, so we made sure they you know, sectioned off areas that were no-go zones, so we didn't drive over orchids and things like that. So it was a whole ecological process. But I do just want to touch on this little bit because this kind of we know what the scene is. Um, So for the whole project, we looked at 15, over 1,500 sites. And we assessed every tree. And we assessed every tree for its you know, condition. Is it a hazardous tree? If it's a hazardous tree, we then did an ecological assessment on it as well. And the vast majority were, were through the Arrow Ranges. And this is, even for me, not having lived it, this is still a fairly raw and touchy um, impact. And after we did all those assessments, we came back and looked at approximately 400 properties again when the removal, when the make safe was happening to undertake fauna salvaging effectively. So it wasn't only any fauna that was in the trees, that might be in the trees, you know, there's a nest there, or there's some loose bark there, there's a hollow at the base of this tree, there's an exposed root plate where the tree's kind of gone on an angle and lifted the root up and potential for ground fauna to get underneath. Um, it was also, well, what's the equipment you're bringing into the site? How is that potentially going? Oh, hang on, we know that there's a wombat well, the, the resident has told us there's one that burrow there. Well, we have to make an exclusion zone for that. So you have to work around that. So the ecological impacts of the storm is what I'm going to, it's what we're primarily going to focus on. So we look at, so obviously the loss of trees from the natural and the urban environments. That's a pretty obvious one. So, with that loss, we've led to a loss of habitat for birds, arboreal species such as possums, gliders, and a whole range of other fauna. And we're not just talking about the ones associated with the trees, and we'll have a look a bit later. The impacts in the mid-story and the ground cover vegetation further impacted that, you know, complicated, compounded that impact. If it was just the trees and the trees were the only thing that was impacted, fine. But when the trees fell over, when they had work screws coming and going, etc., um, that meant the shrubs and the ground cover have to move logs out of the way or have to, you know, cut pathways in to get to those particular, you know, hazardous trees. So that impacted more than just what the tree itself. So one of the, and with everything, you know, the old saying, everything has a silver lining. Well, one of the ecological silver linings to such an event is that it created gaps in the forest canopy. So there is plants in a forest community that may be small and insignificant for a period of time. There may be seeds in the ground that are dormant for a period of time because the canopy provides too much shade, etc. So when the canopy gets opened up, now this could be, you know, in any forest, a rainforest or whatever, when there's an opening in the canopy, it allows more sunlight to get in. Plants, other plants, then literally have their moment in the sun. And by that, they grow, they take off, they have their, might only be 12 months worth, but that's their growing period. That's the, the opportunity that they're waiting for to really do their thing. Um, and it's same with, you know, with a bushfire. All the things that come back after a bushfire may not necessarily have been seen for the 10 or 15 or 20 years prior to that. And particularly things like orchids where that cleaning out of the canopy and the story has enabled the light penetration to get to the ground, 
those plants to shine. And it was many years ago now, the prom, when there was a bushfire through the prom, people, oh, it's devastated the prom. And one of my friends, who's a mad, mad orchid person, goes, oh, but imagine orchids are going to be there. Yes, you know, stuff that may not have been seen for 20 or 30 years. So that is probably the silver line. It gives some plants an opportunity to do, to do their thing, and uh, literally their moment in the sun to do their thing. On the other hand, the gaps in the canopy can also allow weeds to take over. Mm. Disturbance, weeds, um, to take over if not controlled. So you've got you know, a whole range of things that may have been under control, not getting enough light, and then, oh, hang on a minute, hey, let's go. And we'll talk, we come back and talk a bit about this in terms of what we can do a bit later. So these are just some examples. Now, now the same to Deb and I, and I said this, I've also given a similar presentation to Hetman Shire and also to um, Masson and Rangers Council. The images here are not local images. The fauna is, pretty much most of the fauna is, the images are not. So we've got large trees that have hollows in them. Um, that have provided some habitat. We've got where a root plate's been lifted. So the tree's gone sideways, lifted the root plate. This, you know, why, if you're a wombat, why do you need to start digging through the hard stuff to start with when somebody's already half created a home for you, it's softer underneath, you keep going. Small antichinus, reptiles and stuff like that, getting under these root plates. So that's some of the things we were weary of. And sometimes it was recommended, well, they'd just take the tree off, but leave the last three metres and leave the root plate there. The tree's now safe, means it's safe um, from a human perspective, but it's still providing that habitat. So we found things like, you know, um, white, uh, so, uh, white wing chuff nests. We had hollows like this, where the resident has said, Crimson rosellas have been nesting in that tree for five years. Can we do something with it to save it? To make it safe, but save the habitat. We had, you know, so the tall mountain ash, etc., a crop right, and, and the tall trees, the tall um, gum bark trees, effectively. The ones that got the smooth bark, not the stringy bark, not the boxes. Um, the ones like mountain ash or, or river red gums or manna gums, etc. Particularly the ones that had the loose exfoliating bark halfway up the trunk, as, as in this picture. Uh, the arborists were checking them out, or under the supervision of our, or under the direction of our ecologists, were checking out the bark because we know microbats live in that type of bark. And we're talking about microbats, and some of them, the smallest one is about that size. Sits on the end of your thumb. And if you know what a 10 cent piece, if you remember what a 10 cent piece looks like, <laughs> or two pieces of chewing gum, both a 10 cent piece and two pieces of chewing gum weigh more than our smallest micro bat. And it's about four grams, about 3.6 grams is an average for a little, little micro bat called a little forest bat. So they were checking out these bits of bark and things like that as well. Then we had other trees like such that had you know, had distinctive hollows in them and, you know, again, similar story, well, we know a kookaburra was in there or king parrot, so we know there'd been a possum living in there. So wherever we could, we made sure we got up by the climb, it was safe to climb, got a bucket or something like that to actually go looking for what might be in there, to do works, to make safe works, to save as much of the habitat as possible. And where we couldn't save the habitat, because the tree was too far gone, uh, there was a possum living in this, this is actually a, a, a round of a tree trunk. Possum was living in it, hollow was there, possum was there the whole time they were doing works around it, to the point where they had to take the trunk out. So my colleague just said, okay, chop, 
top and bottom, which is what it is. So it's about that size. The hollow is still there. They put it in. A, they moved it into another tree. They rigged it in. As you can see, it's pretty well rigged in. So the possum had somewhere to go at least that night, maybe the next night, and, and down the track. So it still had its smell about its hollow. It might just be in a different spot. Um, a tree from, this is a tree in a backyard in the middle of Seaford. I'll give you the location. Um, it was an exotic tree. It was, it had died some time ago. It had fallen over. And it's had all this bark. Now under the bark, that's two of half a dozen geckos that I just picked up from under the bark. And stuff like, and, and stuff like that would have gone on the back of a truck or through a chipper or something or the like that. But no, picked out, made sure, so it was not just the big fluffy cute things, um, small reptiles, um, spiders even, spiders, scorpions, um, a nest of magpie chicks that we found parents, we couldn't relocate the nest so we relocated the, the nest and the chicks out to the Hillsville Animal Hospital. You know, Hillsville Sanctuary, um, and made a donation to the, the, the sanctuary. So we do a lot of this work on all sorts of projects. Um, you might have heard of, heard of North East Link. Um, the whole range, you know, people wanting to build just their own little, have their own little patch where they need to build a house, but they need to get a permit to remove three or four trees, and the council says you've got to have fauna inspection or a fauna ecologist or a wildlife handler on site while you're removing the trees. So we do all this all the time. And one of, one of our company policies is that if we have to move wildlife to a wildlife shelter, we make a donation on behalf of the client, whoever our client is, and we add that to their bill. Whether it be Bill and Betty who are just building a house, or whether it be a multi squillion dollar project, it gets added to the bill because there has to be some recognition that what you're doing is impacting stuff. And somebody's got to look after it, and that somebody being a wildlife shelter doesn't get any cash to look after it from the government. You know, all the, and we've got, we actually have wildlife shelter people work for us because I like, you know, I like to support them because, you know, it's at least putting some money through their pocket because they're forking out a lot of money to look after wildlife of all sorts of things. So things like these magpie chicks. Um, a couple of the sites around here had echidnas wandering through the wandering through the works during the day and this 20 ton excavator is operating as well. Stop, grab the echidna or at least stop work while the echidna's there until it's moved out of the danger area. A number of times I actually wrapped them in the jackets and moved them off. If you've ever tried catching a kidna, they're not very catchable because the first thing they do when they're confronted is they dig themselves into the ground and then just leave their spines sitting out like this. So it's almost like you've almost got to dig them out. And uh, yeah, it happened on more than one occasion because it, where did it stop? Right beside the excavator. Where does it try to dig in? Right beside the excavator. Or beside the log that was about to be moved by the excavator. So we've got these types of things. I said cute and cuddly, maybe prickly as well. Um, magpie like chicks uh, nest, and we actually were able to move to the next tree um, where we could. Koalas. Not so much here in Gippsland, some of the sites had koalas. Uh, tree, go turn up to the site to work on this tree that had fallen into tr tree A, had fallen into tree B. Tree B had two koalas just sitting in it. And I said, how are you going to do it? Oh, we, they were just going to pull the tree out. I said, nah. So my colleagues rang and said, nah, stop work. That's it. They come back another day when the koala's not there. The moment they go to pull that tree out of tree B, it's going to have an impact on the koalas. Now, I don't care whether, <laughs> I don't want it to hit the news, but I don't care whether that was the situation. It just was stop work. And come back and do it another day. If it's not in imminent danger, imminent hazard, stop work, we can do it another day. 
a little bit of a a, uh, a bunch of leaves sitting up in a fork of a tree turned out to be a possum dray. So this is a, so that's the the leaves there, and this is the possum dray here. There's no top on the possum dray. It was mum and a couple of young ring tails. Okay, what do we do? We worked around it. We tried to work around it the best we could. Frogs? The odd frog under the bar, beside the tree, etc. was collected and moved off. We're not fauna as here, we you know, we'll capture and move everything. Um, a couple of species of local lizards, the garden skink and the delicate skink. Um, and others. Um, got a call one day, oh, there's a blue tongue under a sheet of tin, which is right beside, went there, it was, uh, sorry, it was a snake under a sheet of tin, and it turned out to be just a, at least a blue tongue. But when you only see yeah. that much, it's got stripes, <laughs> it's got a tail. Oh, don't worry about looking at the head of the one that's got legs. But, but it was all sorts of stuff. And this is one, this is one we got, this is the only one we didn't find out, we got this one in Gippsland. Um, it was about a 1.2 metre copperhead that one of our guys just picked up, bagged up, took it off site. Because no arborist likes working around snakes. <laughs> no arborist likes working around bees for that matter either, but that's a different story. Um, but that was just some of the fauna that, actually there's another one here, and it's not just the vertebrates. Um, we managed, particularly in this area, we managed to rescue a number of burrow and crayfish. One site, from memory, they'd done all the work, we got called back because when they were doing some replacements and make safe, some reparation works, they're putting in some posts for retainer. I'm like, oh, hang on, we've got burrowing crayfish here. And uh, we finished up grabbing three or four burrowing crayfish out of that site. Now, Danion's burrowing crayfish, which is one of the species that are here, is actually a threatened, a state threatened species. So, whether it's common, whether it's threatened, whether it's got a vertebrae, whether it doesn't, whether it's got eight legs, four legs, two legs, no legs, we, our role was to try and you know, protect as much of the ecology of the wildlife as we could. So, that's what happened. What can we do about it now? In some ways, um, creating habitat for fauna is pretty easy. What we lost is pretty tough um, all round. Um, the hollows can take 100 to 150 years to form in some cases. Some cases it's much quicker, so if a, a branch has fallen out of a tree, um, opened up the trunk, fungi can get in, fungal spores can get in, um, insect can get in, start to do their thing on the inside, cockies and parrots and stuff come on, oh hang on, we've got a soft bit here, we start to, start to dig it out, or possums, start to dig out the, the spongy um, dead wood in the middle of the tree. So it can be a lot quicker, but for a lot of trees, it's a long time. So really, any, any actions that, that we do to help recreate habitat for your local fauna in your own backyards can be a very healing and rewarding process for, every, for all concerned. I used to live on 450 square metres in Croydon and my back fence was about the wall here, front up, this is my laundry door and that was my back fence. I didn't have a lot, put up a couple of nest boxes, planted a whole lot of native species. And the bird list for my well, and immediate surrounds was over 40. I had six or seven different mammals, um, half a dozen reptiles, two frogs, in 450 metres in Croydon. And there was not really not a patch of native vegetation within 500 metres, really. 
in fact, a nice patinated vegetation within about two kilometres. Yeah, we had things like white brown scrub rings and grey fantail and spinebills, and we'll talk a bit about them in a minute. So it wasn't only tree habitats that were impacted, we mentioned that, that mid-story and ground layers also. So we're going to tick off on some of this, this tree, this tree bit, obviously. We can look at the habitats, how we can do the habitats of the trees and maybe picking up nest boxes and stuff like that. But what about the other bits? And we'll look at that down the track. So one of the, as I said, one of the most important resources um, for local fauna is what the trees provide is a hollow or somewhere to live. Now, like humans, fauna need food. They need water. So they need somewhere to eat, somewhere to drink, something to drink, somewhere to sleep, had that for somewhere to mate, and produce young. Um, lots of fauna, I think I did a quick calculation, there's about 70 species of fauna, birds, mammals, um, that use hollows for nesting in this area, at least 70 species. Whether it be the ones we know about, the obvious ones, the kookaburras, the rosellas, or whether it be micro bats, or whether it be owls, or possums, or gliders, or tree creepers, shite thrush, all sorts of things, ducks even, um, all have this need for hollows. Okay, so what we got, so this is um, sugar gliders, sorry, creft gliders, they're no longer called sugar gliders. Um, okay, quick taxonomic, quick taxonomic lesson. Um, all what was called sugar gliders all across eastern Australia uh, were thought to be one species with different, with two different subspecies. The one that occurred right down from Cape York all the way to Victoria, partially into South, uh, you know, touching to South Australia, was considered one species, a one subspecies. And then there was another subspecies that was out in the drier savannah woodlands in western Queensland into the Northern Territory. About two years ago, they did a taxonomic review as to what's happening at the moment, and actually discovered that the sugar glider, which was the first one that was named, where, where the original specimen came from, so between roughly Brisbane and Sydney, on the eastern side of the Great Dividing Range, was actually a different species to the one that was on the western side of the Great Dividing Range, going from Victoria right up to Cape York. And the one that was in the savannah was a different species again. So they couldn't then call everyone who was no longer a sugar glider. So the, the first ones were the ones in the eastern side of the Great Dividing Range, they kept the name sugar glider. The ones in from Victoria on the right like through on the western side of the Great Dividing Range were called Kreft gliders after Kreft, who was an early zoologist at the Australian Museum, like going back into the 1800s. And of course, the ones that are in the savannah were called savannah gliders. So that's why it's changed. So people still know them as sugar gliders, but being a stick off the taxonomy and correctness, I like to call them Kreft gliders these days. Um, so this is a family living in a nest box. That nest box um, is probably 25 years old or so, and is just made of slabs of timber. Nothing fancy with a hollow in it. The lid's attached with an old piece of rubber, or actually, I don't think the, that box, the lid's attached with an old piece of, like, CFA hose. It's that canvas type thing. Um, this, is, this box is up in the Rushworth forests, um, west of Nagandi, the, the, fauna, the field naturalist called Victoria, based in Blackburn. Um, we have a, a whole nest box program up in that forest. So this is just an example of you know, animals using nest boxes. So, now there's some downfalls in nest boxes. They don't have this, you know, nest box that's like, like such. It's not quite the same 
thermal properties as a tree that might be twice the size and four times as thick. So in that regard, they may not be used all year round. During the summer they might be too hot, during the winter they might be too cold, so animals will come and go and choose, but at least they're having an option. And if the nest boxes are primarily for birds, especially for parrots and ducks, they may only be used by them during the breeding season. Normally parrots outside the breeding season will perch in trees and shrubs and things like that. They won't live in the nest box. Um, only a couple, including Australia's smallest um, night, nocturnal bird, the owl at nightjar, they will live in a box or a hollow year round. And the other thing is, well this is not, this is not really, I suppose, a disadvantage. The species other than what you might have thought you'd planned the nest box for, may also use the box. So if you've got a parrot box, say for you know, three months of the year, parrots will use it. And potentially, uh, this is the parrot box. So potentially, the other six months of the year, or nine months of the year, you might have it occupied by a ringtail possum, or a sugar glider, or a whole range of other things. So while they've kind of got um, designs, etc., that say, you know, this is kind of what we're pitching it at, it may not actually be the case. And I've got some examples of that later. So what we've done, when we're out on the job, on any job, if we find hollows that are, instead of them going <laughs> through the chipper, we actually get the arborist to cut them in about 45 centimetre lengths. We put a top on them, we put a bottom on them, we put a, a mount on them, and we put them back out in the environment. As I said, it takes 150 years, potentially 100, even, even say it's just that, really 50 years to create a hollow, and 30 seconds to put it through a chipper. Some of my guys from, from here, or one of the guys come home one day, come back to our house and in Croydon, back to the office, I went, I've got a hollow for you. Yeah. I up the boot, the car's sitting like this, mind you, <laughs> and the driveway is actually down here, so the, so the back of the car is actually almost dragging on the, dragging on the road. I don't know how I got over some of the speed bumps. And it opens up and there's this round of mountain ash that is this size, and it's that deep, and it's got a hollow in it. And it's got, I said, I'll give you a hand. He goes, oh, how'd you get it in? He goes, oh, I lifted it in. I went, I didn't hear that. <laughs> that is 101, workplace health and safety, injured back for sure, lifting a 40 kilogram hollow into a car, and then as I said, driving like this all the way. So, what we do is we don't, um, so when we get it, we, you know, do a number of things. And one of the things that we look at, if we have to build a box, so sometimes we've been asked to build specific like, duck boxes. So we make sure the timber's more than 15 mil thick. 18, 19 mil um, marine ply is good. Uh, so these, these fit the bill, quite thick slabs, helps with the thermal properties. Marine ply, form ply or hardwood, and this because they generally last the longest. Um, now these are all radiated pine on from memory. Which um, yeah, yeah. So so all these boxes are from timber that was salvaged from the whole storm impact area. So all the big stuff was taken to Romsey in the back of the truck, chipped, cut up, slabbed up. Whatever. So these are ultimately recycled boxes, which is what we're always on about anyway. Mm. Now, marine ply, you can buy it from Bunnings. Yeah. Form ply, if you know somebody that's a trade and works on a construction site, got any form ply? Do any concrete work that you've set the you know set the form up, filled it with concrete. A week later, you're going to take the form out, and then the form goes. In the, in the skip bin, 
I was on a job site, well, I've actually been on a couple of job sites in the last 12 months, so I got to one site in the city, is a bit hollow, include, you know, the diameter of the entrance hole. So, is this suitable for a parrot? There's no point having a little entrance hole if you're expecting a parrot to get in there, it's not going to work. There's no point having a huge entrance hole if you're wanting a parrot to get in there, because other things are going to take it over pretty quick, i.e. brush tail possums. Uh, a ring tail possum would use this, it's quite reasonable. They don't, a ring tail possum about a 40 mil hole is about all it needs to get in and out. Quite, so the diameter of the entrance hole. Now, the size also, this is quite, quite fitting. You, you know, this wouldn't be a, a hollow for, say, a powerful owl or a yellowtail black copper too, which might need a hollow that's about this size. You know. um, this one, the, the Crest Glider box doesn't have an internal partition, this one does. So if you put your hand in here, when you get your boxes, you'll notice there's a piece of timber in there. So what it actually is, is if we've got a... It's a rectangle. Yeah. Um, if you can imagine, you're looking down on the box, the hollow is down here, and there's a partition come up here. So it forms a little triangle at the entrance. So what the gliders will do is they'll go in, because they're mammals, they've got fairly good flexibility to go in, up the partition and build, the nest build their nest behind the partition. It stops all sorts of things like in your miners, common miners going in, we'll use this as a nest as well, because they don't have the flexibility to go up and... So the partition stops. Um, I've seen nest boxes that have, where the hollows at the front have a baffle down the front like such, like that, because common, uh, common miners are known to like to fly straight to the hollow. If there's a baffle there, they can't fly straight to the hollow. But a possum can go in and around. So there's a whole range of little intricacies and designs it might be that Depending on the situation, um, the hollows towards the back of the ho of the the entrance hollows towards the back of the nest box. So when it's facing up against the tree, again the birds don't have direct flight in. They have to do a three, you know, a sharp turn, U bend to get in. But the animals that come up and down the trunk can come up and just go straight in. So there's a whole range of little. Idiosyncrasies like that about how we go about designing our nest boxes. This is my old mate, old mate, male, male brushy. Big hollow, big entrance hole, no lid. Put the lid on, he knocked it off a few times and I just forget it. You know, you know what I mean, I like stubborn. <laughs> um, there you see, that, just that, that was his box. And I'd climb up into the tree and have a look at him. <laughs> as he's doing right here. You know? But you'll notice in this box there's also some wire. It used to be a thing to put wire in the side of the box to help the animals climb in and out. As is this box. These boxes are cut up the front to add a bit of climbing. And they're not, but I think the partition in this one is actually scored. Yeah, the partition in here is scored as well to help climb up and down. It used to be wire. I hate wire. This wire is a classic example. It's come off the staples. It's come up and it's hanging there. If you've got an animal coming and going, particularly a young animal for the first time it's about to leave the nest, box and it gets caught on that wire, if it's a glider. Now the reason why they're called gliders, they've got a membrane between their wrist and their ankle effectively. Mm -hmm. And when they climb, they climb quite well, and when they jump, they look like those Red Bull jet suits. <laughs> Which is actually where the, the design for the suit has come from, these animals that glide. So the membrane from there to there enables them to glide. Young gliders, young parrots get caught in that wire no matter how great your box is and how great your intentions were, it may not get out. It doesn't get out. 
it's dead. If it does get out and it's got ripped membrane or something like that, it may not heal properly. The last thing you want to do is find, oh. yep, all good intentions. So the only reason why I didn't take the wire out because he wouldn't let me. I'd have to go there to, you know, and is he there? To, oh, no, he's not there. Oh, it's pouring rain. Oh, I've got to climb up in the tree. No, and I'd go back the next day. He was okay. He just, the fact that he had a few nicks in his ears showed he'd been having a bloom and often heard blooming with the other possums around the place. So the position, now this is one thing that really, when you're considering where you're going to put your nest box, this is one thing that really you need to take into account. Where are you going to put it? What's the fauna that they're designed for? And what are your local weather conditions? I asked people, I asked people the last presentation, how many of you have your front door facing south or southwest? Anybody here? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Is it because you live on the right side of the street? Maybe. But what the situation is, would you deliberately put your house, your front door of your house, into the worst prevailing temperature, worst prevailing weather. You open up the front door and it's raining outside and all you're getting is rain. You open up the front door and it's windy outside and all you're getting is wind. So, knowing your local weather conditions, I always put the hollow at least to the east, where theoretically is better wind conditions. Theoretically. <laughs> Um, so in this situation, this would be alright potentially on the southern side, the southeastern side of the tree because your hollow is down here. So you're not going to get the weather in, you're not going to get the bad weather into the hollow. This one would almost have to go on the east side, wherever possible. If you're facing it that way into the worst wind, you're getting rain, you're getting the wind, etc. coming through. So it's a bit about comfort, but it's a bit about the usability of the of the, um, the box as well. They're both they're both designed for animals that can fly. So putting it up on a single tree with no other connectivity, so connectivity is shrubs, you know, connecting, canopy of trees connecting, etc. The parrot one would be okay. Parrots will fly to and from the box. You might find that if, you, if it's just on a single tree and there's no connectivity, you may get parrots to it and that might be it. If possums do decide they're going to use it, they either go up the tree and only live in that tree, but if they have to go to the next tree or the next tree, and you've heard possums jump across your roof and run around and run along the fence and run over the power lines, etc. If there's no connectivity, the possum has to come to the ground. What happens when the possum comes to the ground? You've got dogs, you've got cats, you've got foxes, and you've got those four-legged things that have rubber legs that go round and round and round. You've also got vehicles. So animals coming to the ground opens them up to predators, including cars, I'm going to call cars a predator, including predators that potentially you know, impact on them. But if it's in a tree and they've got some connectivity, they can move, they can have that connectivity through the environment, through the backyard, without having to come to the ground. So that's what I say about what form they use it, what the local conditions and where you're going to put it. So I'm going to give you, this is, a, this is about 2.2 metre long. This is probably the death now for me using my car. The Prado to cut stuff around. 2.2 metre long log, sugar gum. I got the arborist to help me push it into the car. And, you know, it's carpet on the back of the car. Didn't have anything on the carpet. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, but out of that box, I made about five nest boxes out of it. So this was a natural hollow, in this, and that was a partial hollow. 
it was as it was going further and further up the tree, it was, the hollow was getting smaller. So we started to chip it out and we put a little petition. It's only a small petition, but it's enough to stop the, any birds getting in and then doing a right hand and going up. So it's only a small petition is, but it would be enough. So animal comes in the hole. The hollow is just down there. Animal comes in, up the petition, and builds the nest behind the petition in here. Create some holes. This one was interesting. This one actually cut the back off first because it was a big round. Cut the back off, put a straight petition like this on the back, built the rest around it, put in a hollow, and that's a range of hollows that we've made out of that, but also out of others. So some of this was from material that we rescued from here, from this project. So we've got different size hollows, large ones, small ones. We've got use of natural hollows. We've got one here for pardalites, which has no hollow, it's just a solid hollow log. Front, back, and an entrance tube, which pardalites like. They like a little entrance tunnel into the nest box. This one here is for bats, so it's all covered except for the base there, which is about a centimetre. The black base here is about a centimetre shorter than the actual fit for the hole. So the bats come in and climb up because bats will hang up, bats hang upside down mm. in the hollow. So they don't go generally don't go down a hollow, they like to go up up a hollow. Um, huge heavy ones like this would probably need a crane to lift into the tree. We haven't put that one out yet. But most of these have gone out into the environment in other locations. So, a couple more things. Painting them. Okay, painting it, weatherproofing it, great. There is, some, there is an advantage as well. Um, other added benefits to having painting, the boxes painted. So this is effectively how I would whip up the boxes. They have a, a bar here which we use to attach to the tree. It's bolted. So we can, not every tree's straight. Some trees are on angles, some trees have got forks. So we can adjust that to the right position where we want the fork and then we attach it. So you can actually purchase nest boxes kits, so you guys are getting nest boxes, but you can purchase them as kits. Um, we can purchase them as whole boxes. I know Karanga has nest boxes for sale. They're the Latrobe University boxes. So you can also Google Latrobe University and they'll send you out a kit for a small possum, a large possum, a parrot, a parlor, a microbat, etc. Um, you can get a whole lot of patterns online or from books. There's books on building nest boxes, etc. Or other sources. Um, Mansions. Mansions. I love, I love Mansions. So if anyone wants a second box, um, uh, our mentions have agreed to offer them at a, uh, at a, you know, at a reduced price. Um, and the Belgrade Men's Shed does like about 15 different types of nest boxes. Montrose does them as well. So it's kind of great to support. Yeah, so support all around. You know. um, now, this is a bit of since I mentioned. When you put them together, if you're using power tools, screws, etc., be careful. And during installation, be very careful. Um, they don't need to go 15 metres up in the tree. At the top of the ladder will be fine. So, top of the roof, even more, I've seen um, gliders, actually I've, I've, looked at, I've taken down trees where gliders have been nesting below my hip height. Mm -hmm. The hole's been about there, and they've been nesting below that. But about three metres up the tree is probably all you need. If you're going to put them up yourself, get somebody to hold the ladder for you. And not only that, strap the ladder to the tree first. Climb the tree, strap the ladder, make sure it's firm. Um, position for a ladder is the feet at your feet and your arms like that. So it forms the triangle. That's the recommended. That's what I've been told. Is that, well, did a ladder training course. That was all the recommended position of the ladder, not too far, not too far back, not too far forward, but about triangle like such. 
Strap it to the tree, make sure the ladder doesn't move before you really get up there because you're going to be up there and you're going to have something that's going to be attaching this nest box to a tree. So you need to effectively, three points of contact, doesn't include your head. <laughs> right, you know, you have one, two, and you've got the last, you hold on to the tree and you're trying to put the mm. thing. The good thing I like about this, um, you've got screws rather than nails. Nails tend to pop out, screws last a lot longer. One little bit of advice I would suggest, because trees happen to grow, um, is use something that's flexible as a spacer. So maybe you've got your screw, you're putting it in, like such. Um, get some grommets that they use for um, um, laser light, etc. Put it between the screw and the nest box. So screw it in. And it means it's not going to go the full length of the screw, but you know, it's just, so it's not going to go the full length of the screw. It might sit out like such, like such, but it gives a little bit of breathing space so if the tree grows, the box can move a little bit. Um, nails often, tree grows, nails get pulled through the box, the material. Um, so that, stick it in there, because the last thing you want is the box to fall down at some stage um, when it's got something in it. So screws, be careful. If you're not sure, um, get your mates to help you. Get somebody who might be, um, you know, might have done it regularly to come and do it. You can also offer, um, uh, we've got about 15 minutes to go. Yep. Um, uh, we can also offer, if anyone is really struggling to get their nest box up and needs help, please let us know. Um, because we're uh, uh, putting together a little group of volunteers who are experienced with this who can help do that. We can't put everyone's nest box up, but we've got, um, because otherwise we'll lose our volunteers. No amount of cake will keep them going. But if you, if you are going to struggle at all or you don't have anyone that can help you, um, please let myself or Hannah know and then, um, and then we can help you get that up. Beauty. So, once you put your nest box up, You've got it there. You want to monitor. You want to monitor what's happening with your nest box. Okay. So regular monitoring of what's going on with your nest box. Now, regular might be depending on what you have you do it. Might be once every three months, once every six months, once a year, or something like that. Um, can be really rewarding. But it's also necessary to achieve what you might want to achieve. I was out literally on Friday looking at putting out some cameras in a patch of local bushland um, in, near Nunnawaddy and they'd created all these nice tree hollows. They'd changed the hollows where they'd cut holes in dead trees with chainsaws and they'd put face plates in with different size holes. And both the tree hollows that I found had feral bees in them. It's not providing habitat for, for native fauna. It's, and feral bees themselves, honeybees, you know, there's a story of honeybees are in demise across the world. But in Victoria, it's legislated under the Flora and Fauna Guarantee Act that, that feral bees using, nest, using tree hollows is a threatening process, which means that, short, effectively says, they are actually potentially threatening fauna that are already threatened. So, um, bees using hives might be threatening things like brush tail can't have to, They can't get access to the hollow, reducing the number of hollows available to native fauna. So yes, they're a threatening process. Um, so, nest boxes can provide homes for feral species such as common miners, bees, etc. So you keep an eye on them. So, This has to be one of, the, one of the joys of the whole thing. How do you go about checking out what might be using your, your nest box? So firstly, simple as just getting a pair of binoculars and just observing, is there anything coming and going from your box? 
Secondly, looking for marks on the box. This is why I said the benefits of painting nest boxes are great. This is all green. If you look up in six months' time and you see that there's bits of paint being taken off around the edge and that there's unpainted material around the edge and there's nicks and scratches and bites and things, you know something has actually been sussing out your nest box. Or well, may very well be using it. If you're using the binoculars and you can see that bits, there's bits of hair and things hanging there, you know that some, something's been coming and going. So, that's where painting is, has those added benefits. Looking for marks on the box that indicates that something's coming and going. Something's obviously coming off in this one. That's a box that's probably had a brushed out possum go, if that hollow is too small, I'm going to create my own. You know that's a used box. <laughs> webcam, you can actually you can actually get a webcam if you're really techno. A webcam, do a little hole, put a webcam in the top of the bird and you can sit and watch it all the time. You can use a pole mount, you can use a pole mounted camera. Something like this that you can actually put in now. It's good for the parrot box, it's no good for the sugar glider, but for the glider box because you've obviously got that partition in there. But you can, or a little GoPro on a pool pole with a little light. You can actually just stick it, stick it up here, check out what might be in the box. Or, and I'm sorry to have to put you through this bit, or you can physically inspect it. They used to be my favourite pair of shorts, <laughs> but my wife hated them. <laughs> so, the physical inspection, you get, you get out, you kind of have you look in. These, as I said, obviously these don't have removable lids. To try and discourage that, that's okay. Um, there is advantages. Physical inspection this can have issues for the animals because if you're sitting on the side of the hollow and you go, oh, I wonder what's in here, and you're looking down and the entrance hollow is at your body, the animal's got nowhere to go if there's an animal in there, and the chances are the animal's going to go straight at, what's it looking at? Straight at your face, you're going to go, whoa! And there's a three metre drop to the ground. Not so good. We do not encourage, encourage anyone to get up on a ladder and inspect. Yeah, yeah, so... Please don't do that. <laughs> this is a message from the council. <laughs> no, it's a message from Jim who cares about him and doesn't want to lose residents. So. <laughs> Because there's apparently, it's apparently a statistic that it's men over 50 are the most likely to fall off a ladder. And I go, that's a bit rude, maybe you make it over 54. Um, but physical aspect, so you can. But one of the best things to do, one of the best things to do in the late afternoon, sit down with, your, with a nice glass of red or a glass of white, and just sit and look at your box. Coming into dusk, particularly dusk, I'm not a drinker, but I know that when I mentioned this the other day, they went, holy oh, hell yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> just, just have a moment in your garden observing what's going on. Listen to the birds, just be there. And I think that's probably part of the whole thing. Just, it's about healing, you know, or was it healing your gardens, etc. It's not about healing your gardens, it's about healing everybody else as well. Just take time, relax, observe what's going on. Now, these are some of the reports. Let's have a look at this. Fauna is always the first priority. So, you know, you don't want to be doing too many things that are going to disrupt the fauna on a regular basis. That's why I said if you want to do it, you know, the more, you know, the camera in the box or something like that. Don't do it every week, every month, do it every couple of times a year. Think about when to check them, what's the method, location of the ladder, you didn't see that bit. But how are you going to do it? Now the rewards can be wonderful. That nest box, so this is the internal petition again. That's the hollow, this is the petition, and that there is at least nine <laughs> gliders packed in. And the, we, I'm sitting there going, uh, here we go, uh, hang on, one, two, three, five, no, hang on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, at least nine, um, there's probably, could even be a dozen in there, 
That was, the whole box was just full of items. And then you got this bit. Oh, hang on, I'm gonna hit them. Maybe we can do that vote, but this is actually a duck. Oh. And then you've got this is a number of metres up the tree, and the ducklings just. <laughs> so mum's calling these ducks, they're calling these ducklings out of this box. <laughs> and look, they bounce. Who would have thought ducklings bounce? Have a look at this. <laughs> Tough love. <laughs> and she's still calling to them. Dad hasn't turned up on the scene yet. But she's still calling them. So this is a wood duck. There's three. Come on, where's the rest? Four, five, what's that? Five, six. And she's still going, well, hang on, on, on seven. Mother duck said, quack, quack, quack. And seven little ducklings jumped out of the box. And then Dad turns up and goes, oh, you know, I'll be now. Well, oh, good. <laughs> but... How do they get back? They don't. Oh. Once the, once the ducklings leave the nest, that's it. They don't go back. So that nest is now available, effectively now available for something else to use. As a bird, so they will be forever now. Mum will have them on the water. Mum and Dad have them on the water. Feeding in your backyards. And it's not rocks. They will nest in trees. They, People do not know the ducks nesting trees. Going Cambridge Road from Swansea Road, going there one day, I'm driving out this way. Um, this wood duck just went, I'm oh, sorry, across the front. Like, there's a hole in that tree, wood ducks nesting in that tree. Just the duck just flew straight in front of the car mm -hmm. to the hollow. We've got one at our place, you know, like the stumps, the stumps like. Bird meters or something. Yep. Mm. And there's, there's this duck, first of all, I couldn't believe, there's this duck right at the top of this. Yep. Thing. Mm. And also in the forest across the road from us, like way up high, yep. like so high up, there's this. And these ducks, they jump out of the nest and they bounce off the ground and they all think. So some of the birds that we might see, that you'll be familiar with these birds, but these are the nest, these are the um, ones that we use in nest boxes. Crimson rosella. <laughs> Eastern Rosella. This is one I call the sauce bottle. You try to describe people. People have no idea you're talking about Eastern Rosella. You say, Rosella sauce? And I go, oh yeah, okay. I can't remember that. Eastern Rosella. You've got the rainbow lorikeet. You've got a smaller lorikeet called a musk lorikeet. You know, sulfur crested cockies. You go, ours. So they're all some of the birds, some of the parrots that have potential to use a box. Then you've got creft glider. So that's a crefty actually in a hollow that um, was created. That's a creft glider nest, lots of eucalypt leaves. Come on, brushies. Now, Go back to the photo where the ring tail was hanging out of, out of the hollow. This was a box that my students, when I was a teacher, my students made me one day. Put it up in my backyard. Male used to use it, female used to use it on opposite days almost. Went out one day and his female stuck their arms, head outside the box. The box was about half the size of one of these. Had a joey in there. I decided to make them a different box, bigger opening. Don't like it better. They never used it, but within <laughs> two weeks, that ringtail possum was coming and going from that nest box. <laughs> so the last bit, which just quickly, other animal homes. We've talked about the trees. We've talked about the nest boxes. But what else can we do in our backyards? Food. We need food. Every animal needs food. Shelter requirements as are varied as the wildlife themselves, and we're talking about. Nest boxes for, for possums and gliders and parrots and things. Reptiles, frogs and small mammals need cover, need mulch, need logs, need rocks. 
And I know in some of the properties, they don't exist anymore. What was there aren't there anymore. Small birds need shrubs. So the shrubs like what we've got outside the window here. And this is where the, the plants and things that you're, you know, that Deb was talking about earlier can help rebuild that habitat. They have to feel safe from predation and the elements, or they're not going to come. Create a, you know, it's like a city, multi story. We've got the big apartment blocks of trees, we've got single in houses, we've got a whole range of different living habitat. That's what we need. Oh, hang on. Um, different dietary requirements, so. A garden is effectively a smorgasbord. The garden that provides a smorgasbord increases the potential for fauna, all sorts of fauna to move in. Whether it be something like this corridor for honey, for spinebills or um, bees, etc. So carnivores, there's omnivores, there's herbivores, there's insectivores, there's nectivores, etc. Cater for as many of those as possible. And we have a diverse range. And I said, diverse gardens like a supermarket has something for everyone. So some of the local fauna, these are just butterflies in your garden. Um, if you've got lemon trees, you might have, or uh, citrus trees, you might have the dingy swallowtail. Orchard swallowtail uh, comes and feeds on the, the citrus leaves. They have food plants, so the larvae have a particular plant and the adults feed on a range of nectar. So mat rushes, grasses, wattles, nettles, daisies, peas, citrus, that type of thing will create, create a whole range of different butterflies and they will be, a, those types of plants are available from the indigenous nurseries, etc. They can be both Native the exotics can be the nectar can be both native and, and exotics. They also like some sunny, sunny positions where they can sunbake and often seen basking on rocks and things. This is a a white beech, a white cedar, sorry, or a lilac tree. Gang gang cockatoos love it. So birds, their diet is varied. Are they seed eaters? Are they nectar eaters? You know, um, do they eat reptiles? You know, um, do they eat insects? Prickly or, or dense shrubs, like some of what we have out here, are really important, particularly near water, so the birds can come in and they feel like they're safe. They come in, they dart, they dart down to the water bowl or the, or the water source, they can get back into the bush if there's birds of prey around. They don't get, you know, if there's miners, so the, the noisy miner, which is a native honey eater, or the common miner, which is the brown introduced um, bird, they don't get harassed so much because there's this diversity of areas they can get to. They're not just constantly being bombarded. This is true outside of my house, oh, what was? Well, still my house, but um, in Croydon, was a Clisterman. It got to the point where it got smashed for a couple of years by sawfly caterpillars, and then it just bushed out to the point where we had eastern spinebills nesting in it. And when we got there, I'll show you the before and after photos when we got there. Now, this is what we're talking about. Deb was talking, remember Deb was talking about tiles. Little reptiles, this weasel skink. There's about uh, half a dozen small skinks that live up in the dandelions. Weasel skinks, garden skinks, delicate skinks, um, metallic skinks. They like rocks and things. I said, you know, rep not too many people will find the snakes. Oh, the snakes here, right, bring them on, where are they? Let's have a look at them. But they're still an important part of the environment. Snakes actually help control house moths, black rats, stuff that we would see as pests. So, but most of the skinks are small egg laying skinks or not producing live young like blue tongues. If you're lucky, a blue tongue will tooth. So little skins like this weasel skin, what do they want? They like to bask on rocks, logs, paths even. Even the leaf litter in nice warm sunny positions, 
But if we don't have that anymore, what, we, what can we do? Do you know where it's a roofer? It does tiling? Gets in half broken tiles. Tiles are great. It used to be tin, put out tin too, but tiles are more like a rock. They're not as obtrusive looking as tin. You can just put a few tiles around in your backyard and that just provides artificial shelter where you once had natural shelter. With like artificial shelter just tucked away, plants can grow over them, not a drama. They prefer great little habitats for small things. And other things, for scorpions, for spiders, for insects. Um, so yeah, just a little, a little thing. They can also, if you've got two areas where you've got some bush and some bush and the rest of it's open, you can just spread some tiles out, even less of course you're, you're mowing them, really. Spread some tiles out and they can be stepping stones from out here. The small stuff to move between sites. So here's your tiles, Deb. This is a. Yay! I'm just saying, yeah. this is in my backyard, you know, they, you know skinks, frogs, yeah. etc. love tiles. A pond that, you know, uh, provide a more long term environment where you can get a, a bird bath, etc. So frogs will happily live near moist and well watered gardens, but we'll need to find that water to breathe. Let's just drop mine. Um, some aquatic plants, some logs, some rocks. Uh, put some mesh over the top. Stop some water birds if you've got a really good population of frogs. Stop the water birds getting into them. And it also stops small humans getting in and potentially um, not getting out. Last pictures. This was my block of land and we lived in a body corporate area. This is my house and that's what my backyard looked like when we got there. And they just chucked in a heap of plants that were just, oh, God, I've got to do some landscaping, that plant, that plant. We actually dug out the plants, even though it was a body corporate, we dug out the plants, we sold the plants in a garage sale and we bought others. We bought native indigenous ones. And that's what it looked wow. like. This is, this is diosma, uh, not diosma, this is um, dioides, which I hate. But this was all those berserias that those spine bills were growing in and nesting in. We had those berserias were spread and now spread to every one of these gardens outside every house. Mm -hmm. um, we had um, the spine bills nesting, got commonly visited by thorn bills. We've had scrub wrens in there. We've had a whole range of stuff just pop in, and that's only a few years, mm -hmm. just from a few indigenous plants. And finally, some acknowledgements to BRV, first of all, um, the Johns Lynn group, because they got us on board and worked quite closely with us. The tree crews we worked with, a lot of them we've never worked with your types before, but by the time they finished, they had a complete new appreciation for our types. And some of them were really good to start with, mind you, some of them were on the ball. Um, our team of ecologists and arborists, this is the important one, this one. People like yourselves who were concerned for their wildlife. The number of people we had come up to us and say, yep, yeah, I can rebuild that, but how do I look after my wildlife? How do I look after the parrots or the, the kookaburra that used to nest in that trip? What can I do? Or just letting you know that there's a wombat burrow just down there near that tree. Or, you know, we've seen this on the property. Yes, we have echidnas moving through here on a regular basis. Many people that we came across that we spoke to were more concerned about what was happening with the wildlife now that this had happened, that the storm had happened, than what they appeared to be concerned about themselves. We can do something. We have insurance, we don't have insurance, but we're okay. But what about the wildlife? And this was the bit that really stuck out with myself and a lot of other people was, no matter what had happened, there was a passion for the wildlife. And no doubt that's the reason why you live here. Because you're, you like the bush, you like what the bush has to offer, and that a lot of that's our wildlife. So thank you, because it made our jobs a lot easier when we knew what kind of what we're looking at. And finally, Yarrangel's staff, like, Deb and Hannah, um, 
for continuing to work through this program um, and engaging people like us to come and talk to you people like you. Thank you. Chicks obviously defecate in their own bo in, the, in their nest. Kookaburra young back out to the edge of the edge of the nest and out. Mm -hmm. So kookaburras don't defecate in their own nests. Um, sugar gliders generally don't. They will, and some other birds will actually remove the fecal matter out of it. But there's a whole range of insects and bacteria etc. that help break it down. Um, one of the things I think you've got some material and stuff to put in the base which helps absorb some of that material. Um, so yeah, so generally it's pretty unlucky. I think all of the nest boxes we've put up and we, we, we monitor, so I was saying the field nuts have something, I think we have about 120 boxes that we go and monitor twice a year and it's very rarely do you find an animal has died, and it's probably died of old age rather than anything else because it's all. Um, but there'll be a natural process. I, I've found found nests where where there's been an animal die in a hollow, and something else has come along and built a nest on top of it. And all you've got is pretty much the dried remains of a a possum or something like that. But in terms of fecal matter, um, fecal matter that will natural process that will. And that will also go to being dry out or <coughs> being consumed by bacteria or fungus or stuff like that. Uh, or insects even. Like you, we've got insects like dung beetles, etc., that will feed on bird feces and all sorts of other things. So part of a natural process. I wouldn't be too concerned about that. Right, thanks, Jim. Is there, is there a good uh, reference text on um, flora and fauna for Daniel Mountain? The Fauna, the floral one, I would say, would be the flora of Melbourne, Marion, Marilyn Bull. It's really good. It's really good. Melbourne is the yeah. It is the book. It, it's about it's about yay thick. Yeah. It's about one hundred and twenty dollars. Mm -hmm. We're trying to buy two or three copies. I've just got to see how much I can manage my budget. Um, and to to um line out to residents, you know, for a couple of weeks or something like that. Mm. So I think Kerry, you've and you've got the flora have you got the flora of Melbourne? Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. The yeah, flora of Melbourne is, is a spectacular book. Uh, not only for the fact that it identifies the flora across the greater Melbourne area, but it goes into the back and talks about, you'll see when you open up the back cover, there's the areas of Melbourne and there's numbers. So in the Daniel Ranges, there might be seven, eight, ten numbers, and those numbers correlate to sites. And when you go looking at the vegetation descriptions, it will say of a particular plant, site 57, 64, 68, 69, 70. You go, and so that gives you local sites where these plants occur. Uh, so in terms of that, that would be the, the flora book, I would say, for sure. Okay. There's a little um, book, the Sherbrooke oh, yeah. Flora. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's quite handy. Yeah. You know, yeah. And in terms, of, yeah. in terms of fauna, I would probably, uh, I was going to say, 
There is a there is a book put out by the Victorian Museum about the wildlife of Melbourne, but it's out of print and it's been out of print for a long time. If you see one in an op shop, grab it. They they are gold. They are they are really good. In, um, there's probably some little local guides around the place that might, you know, like that little Sherbrooke book or something like that that might have been put together. Um, because you, you know, if you if you want one for birds and mammals and reptiles, you got you got a backpack, you got 20 kilograms worth of books. Um, so in terms of that, but I definitely recommend that flora of Melbourne. That is gold. We'll let you know when we've got some copies if anyone. Do you think, would it be useful to have some, like a, we created a little bit of a library that you could borrow some books, would that be useful? Yeah, yeah and you could share them around. The Sherbrooke one, I think there's a new one that's just come out, I was speaking to the Land Care Group on Friday night, so they've got some new ones, they're only $20. Um, I might get some to gift out to some residents and we'll call some in the library, so. I think Caracas right. sells quite a great Yeah, they used to yeah. sell a great when I was there the other day, but it wasn't this. They used to have double-sided bookcase that was this size. They've now just got a boutique selection that maybe wouldn't even fit on this table. The field mats, the FNCB in Blackburn, I'm going to put in a plug for them. Um, they have a, a bookshop there that if you remember, it's 20% discount off recommended retail price. But if you're a non-member, you can still get it and they'll post it out to you. Okay. Uh, also, I was wondering, um like up here, what I have been wanting to find for ages is like someone who can give you like a guided tour of Sherbrooke Forest or different areas of the Dandenongs. Who know about the different trees and the ecology and stuff like that? Is there like is there anyone around? Yeah, you're in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've got we've got so for example we've got a guided tour of um, Birdsland um, and we've got Garrick from Southern Dandenongs Community Nursery talking about the plants that are all around there and Kathy Thomas, who's the wildlife photographer, um, who will focus on ethical photography, but there's 50 different types of birds, ducks and everything, that live there. Um, and we've got free posters that explain that. Um, we, we've got, we do some indigenous walks with Bunkamara and Dindy through Sherbrooke, which That's is really incredible. Um, it's How do you find out that though? Oh, through, through our Healing and Our Gardens yeah. program. So you'll actually see them come up. And I'll let you know just before you go today. So we've got three more events. We've got a butterflies event. Um, we've got the walking birds land. And I've got a very limited spaces, only eight places, a forest therapy meditation walk through Sherbrooke Forest on Sunday the 11th. So we're looking mm -hmm. with a forest therapist mm -hmm. who actually will take us into that space for about two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not yoga in the forest. That comes <laughs> next year. But, it's good with that. but, but we're, we're looking at doing a number of walks with guides and also um, looking to see, uh, and also through some of our land here groups and friends of groups as well. So I think the more we can understand where we live and what happens. Um, just, you mentioned something um, very briefly, John. Um, I don't know about you, but I am hunting off shops now everywhere for wildlife books. I found some native books, and I know like native plants, and, and I know some of them are old, but you know, they're still good. Mm -hmm. um, please don't tell me this is bad. I've got it for three bucks on Saturday. And it's got all different types of birds and where they're found and, you know, what That, you know, that used to be, I, I, that was first brought out in the 19, late 90s or mid 1980s. <laughs> and it was a hardcover book and it was yes. that size. Yeah. I remember on my first uni trip in 1988, I was cutting around the full hard <laughs> Because it was one of the first, there was yeah. that one, there was a book by Graham Pizzi. Yeah. Um, and, but prior to that, there was Kaylee's What Bird Is That? Yeah. And that was just 25 yeah. birds on a page, a little, little yeah. Yeah. get out the magnifying glass. That is a fantastic book. Unfortunately, the lead author, Ken Simpson, passed away a number of years ago. Oh. But you can get a copy of that. I, I have... Oh, good. Do the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> I have five, five updates of that book on my, on my, in my library. Every time a new update come out, because they obviously was talked about changing the menclature and stuff before, I'd go and buy a new copy. And I've got the hard cover, this one, this one, this one. Well, what, what, why? Well, because, you know, things change, but there is another really good book. But yeah, that, that's. Go on, that's yeah, and a great book. And everyone's more welcome to borrow that, so I've got one like an Atlas. 
Yeah, yeah. And there's one, there's another dread book out at the moment, the new one with the blue cover uh, by Peter Menkhorst, who used to work for, did a lot of work for Dell, or worked for Dell for years. Um, Menkhorst, Knight, March and Davies, Clark, it's called the Australian Bird Guide. Deep, a deep blue covered book. The second, the revised edition is probably better. The, the first uh, edition had all sorts of dramas, um, particularly the index and the way it was indexed. Uh, but no, that, that's probably the best book on Australian birds now. Uh, in terms of reptiles, there's a book by Wilson and Swan called Reptiles of Australia. Uh, there's also one by Peter Robertson, which is Reptiles of Victoria. Now that's obviously much more specific. Um, so I'd say Reptiles of Victoria is, is a good one. Um, mammals is, Peter Menkhorst has done a mammal book too. It's more like a field guide type thing, a mammal book. Frogs, there's a number of frog ones. But I'd say for frogs, the best, the best thing to get mm -hmm. I think the private number is I've been calling for two and a half hours. <laughs> Maybe we just better shut the phone off. Um, there's a frog app. There's, there's a Melbourne Water yes. frog app. Free to download. You can record. You can submit. They'll tell you what they got. Frog Watch or something like that. Yeah, there's also a one called Frog ID. Yeah. Another app called Frog ID um, that's based out of the Australian Museum. You can sit out there. You can record for 20 seconds, a minimum of 20 seconds. You can record up to a minute. You can register your details, where it is, etc. Submit it, and they will send you an email that says, Our people have listened to this, and this is the frogs that we've heard on you. And then you go, Okay, you know. You so there's a whole lot of stuff out there that can help you increase your knowledge. I reckon the other thing is, is get Yarra Rangers. I don't think Yarra Rangers do it. Do it. Oh, no, they don't do it. Get Yarra Rangers to do the Nature Stewards program. It's run um, by Outdoors yes, Victoria. Yes, yeah, we're trying to get in for because we missed the because you, you could be the uh, like be a Nature Steward for 2022. We missed mm -hmm. that. Um, Hannah is now working in our um, uh, Gardens for Wildlife program. Yeah. So, so there's a Gardens for Wildlife program. Right? The Nature Stewards program goes through everything. Go, looks at geology, looks at flora, fauna. I've done that. It's really good. Yeah, You've done yeah, that. Did, right. did you do it at Knox? Can I ask? I did it. Yeah, Rangers. I oh, did. Yeah, Rangers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So that that's a quite a good good project and gives you an overall view of a whole you know, a holistic view of the local environment and stuff like that. So there's a whole lot of things out there that you can do. And just. <coughs> do something. Anything. Anything. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, do some weeding. If you're feeling, pretty, yeah. if you're feeling a bit ordinary one, if you're feeling a bit ordinary one day, just go and spend half an hour in the garden. Mm -hmm. Just listen to the birds, point out some weeds. Mm -hmm. A, you're helping the environment. B, you're helping yourself. C, you're just taking in. I used to be a school teacher, and if it wasn't for weekends going away, bird watching and stuff. I was a mess. I just, it was just too much. You know, I just have to go twice, three times a month. I'd be away for a weekend, long weekend, whatever, just to recharge my batteries. Because, you know, if you've ever been a full school teacher, it's full on, you know, and, and it was just full on, and I just said, I just need some downtime. I just need to go away and commune in the bush. And no, I just think that's, so. It's such an important thing, and I think many of our residents have been through a lot. Been through a lot. Our wheelbarrows are pretty full at the moment, you know what I mean, with everything that we're dealing with. And so to take that time, so I'm going to find tiles. Yeah, I'm going to go and steal tiles. I won't steal them off anyone's roof. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. But, you know, or just little bits and bits. <laughs> Everyone's going, thank you. Bits and bobs. Or um, I went to the op shop and just bought a, a little shadow bowl. You know what I mean? It was the ugliest thing ever, but put it with water, put it in the yeah, if you're gonna put if, you, if you're gonna put a if you're gonna put a water bowl in, yep. put it in, you're gonna put a water bowl in, put something in it. Yeah. It's one thing for the birds or skinks or something like that, if it's if it's buried in the ground and lizards come along and drink, it's one thing for them to provide a water source, they a fall in, I've got to be able to get out. Mm -hmm. Birds will jump in and have a splash around and jump out, that's okay, but if they happen to, so 
a couple of rocks yep. uh, that, that come out above water level or a, a branch or something like that just so they can land on it, drink, mm. jump in, splash around, jump back out and off they go. Um, so that's great. But the, the, my thing with that is try and make sure that water, because if the birds get used to it being there, they're going to come or they're going to regularly come. If you go away on a month's holiday and suddenly it's not there, and that's the thing with feeding. I don't recommend feeding birds at all. Mm -hmm. You know, people that have fed, fed, fed. Mm -hmm. I said, you shouldn't be doing that. You'll, you'll, ah, you know, that's right. They've gone away on a month's holiday, come back, and the balustrade of the house shredded because of cockies that have just got there's no food. They just start you. Yeah. And they just start <laughs> bored, you know, there's no food. Where's our food, you know? And just, and just completely shredded the balustrade. I'm sitting there, come and talk. I went, I told you so. <laughs> Nasty little critters. Yeah, okay. I want to encourage you, but, but yeah. let them, or if you're going to do it, do it really spasmodic. Yeah. Some, some good quality seed, really spasmodically. Today, maybe Friday next week. So it's not a habit. They've still got to know that they've got to go out and find their own food. They don't become dependent on you. Yeah. 